This week on Africa Health Check. The government needs to take more care and they look after those people who have disabilities. For example, there are children's homes that have been created to embrace people with disabilities. We discuss healthcare access for people living with disability in Africa and discern ways in which we can be more inclusive to their needs as a continent. Hello, good day and welcome to Africa Health Check, where we reflect on the health status of Africa. I'm your host, Hohon Tlejang Paladi. The World Health Organization estimates that at least 18 million people in Africa are affected by some form of disability. On today's episode, we will be discussing access to healthcare services of people living with disability. To help me unpack this, I am joined by Grace Apache Jerry, a recording gospel artist, songwriter, and disability rights activist from Nigeria. I also have the usual commentators, Dr. Marianne Morethi, the current chair of the Department of Medical Microbiology and Immunology and a senior research fellow at the University of Nairobi in Kenya, as well as Reverend Anthony Achampung, who's a pharmacist and a pastor from Ghana. But before we hear from these panelists, let us have a look at this episode's feature. My name is Mersini Damasunga. I am 43 years old. I am from Guiani in Limpombo in South Africa. And I am a media personality. I produce and host my own TV shows. I am a, a sports and fitness brand owner. I am a speaker, I am an activist, and the list just goes on and on. I acquired my disability when I was born, which says I got a disability from a health facility. So that's where my challenges with the health system began. There are many women and many uh, people with cerebral palsy that experience or get that because of the negligence in our health facilities. Being a black woman with a disability is quite challenging and there are so many barriers that you, you, you have to deal with. Firstly, as a black person, secondly, as a woman, and then as a person with a disability, then there's an added dimension from, for me, which is also tribalism. So I always been, been faced with all these barriers. Having had a disability for 43 years, I've gone through all sorts of sinister behavior. I've gone through judgment, I've gone through rejection, I've gone through being outcast, being undermined. You may name them. So they don't really affect me anymore. That, that has given me the freedom to be and live the way I want to live. I know that I, as a black woman with a disability, in doing my business, I will have to work 10 times harder, and I will have to bring in resources and help that is necessary excellence. Unfortunately, we don't get this as black people. Excellence is not an option. Excellence for us, it's the only way because your disadvantages will always be used against you. Health is not everything, but without health and fitness, you cannot do anything. So let us be fit, 
let us be healthy because when we are fit and healthy, we only then we will be able to empower ourselves and empower uh, the African community. We need to perform above average as Africans to show the world that we can. And again, that is our feature for this week's episode. Remember, we are discussing the access to healthcare services by people living with disability. And I want to welcome our special guest for this episode, Grace. Hello. Hello. Hi, everyone. I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much for joining us, Grace. Maybe just start off by introducing yourself. Tell us who you are, where you're from, and what you do. All right. My name is Grace Jerry, Grace Alache Jerry. Um, I'm the Executive Director of Inclusive Friends Association, an organization for persons with disabilities. I am a recording artist. I am a strong gender advocate, a peace promoter. And um, yeah, basically that's that. Lovely stuff. You're a gospel artist, a songwriter, an activist. Maybe just give us a little bit of history. How did you come across all these hats that now uh, you wear, Grace? All right. So um, I would say that um, singing for me is inherent. I, I probably inherited that from my mom because my mom's side of the family are great and amazing singers. And uh, for me, what has made music really stand out is the fact that I have combined um, music and, and advocacy together as a very strong tool to uh, be able to address uh, social issues and basically just to get uh, my uh, messages out there. So, uh, and also being a disability advocate to so stems from my experience as a person um, with a disability. Uh, I sustained spinal injury about 20 years ago. It's exactly 20 years this year. and. Um, I'm a wheelchair user, so I, it's basically my experience as a woman with disability and also my mm. um, inherent ability to be able to sing. So it's a combination of both music and advocacy to bring about disability issues. Maybe you could just briefly take us through your life journey, how your voice transformed or transitioned into now you living with disability, what were some of the major challenges that you have faced and how you've been able to overcome them? All right, so um, I was involved in a road traffic accident about 20 years ago, um, precisely on the 20th of January, 20, 2002. And before then, I, I was very active in the church choir and, um, and I was in school, I was in the university. But I think when the accident happened, it more or less like made my life more purposeful. <laughs> I would say I tell people that because I realized this, the power that I have in my voice, the power to speak up against change. Because when I became mm -hmm. a person with a disability, I, I, I mean, I had to, I mean, I realized how challenging the life of a person with disability is on from day to day living, the kind of barriers that are, are just everywhere in terms of my environment, I mm. couldn't function outside my house. I, um, I couldn't go back to school for like three years because of how inaccessible the lecture halls were. Like I was in the hospital for so many months and it took a while before my life got back to normal. And after that, mm. I had to learn how to navigate my life all over again as a woman with disability and a woman who is on a wheelchair. And that also mm. gave me the opportunity to begin to speak up against um, how much people with disabilities face discrimination and neglect mm -hmm. and how much the society lacks knowledge on a life of a person with disability. So every platform mm -hmm. I have the opportunity to sing, like I've been given uh, a stage and a microphone to sing, I would quickly advocate for the need to make that environment accessible. Hey, put a ramp on this side so people on the wheelchair mm -hmm. can easily move. And then I do that and I sing my song. So I realized that come, the two of these can actually go together. When you give me the microphone mm -hmm. to sing, I can advocate. And when you give me the microphone mm -hmm. to advocate, I would actually sing. So it's, I have uh, combined the two together. So it's for me, it's advocacy and music. 
addressing the general yeah. challenges that people with disabilities face and how we can generally sensitize people on um, the, 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 from uh, the rights-based approach on how persons with disabilities can have access to mm -hmm. um, their basic amenities and also lead a normal and an active life. Mm. Absolutely, truly inspiring, um, uh, Grace. You know, uh, your name is as powerful as your story, as your resilience, as your character. I think things are just falling into position. I think Reverend would even say amen uh, to that. You are talking about how you transitioned into. Uh, I'll give you a chance to say the amen now if you wish, Reverend. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Love the uh, uh, spiritual energy that's uh, in the in the room right now. I wanted to to say that um, Grace, you mentioned that you decided to be the voice of the voiceless and speak out against things that you're seeing as some of the gaps or challenges that were faced by people living with disability, um, as you were uh, now. What are some of the challenges that you have faced as an activist, uh, particularly for people living with disability? Can you just share some of those obstacles you've come across and how you're able to overcome them? All right. So, yes. Um, at the initial stage, when I started my at the knowledge gap of these, the key stakeholders and the decision makers, there's a huge gap in terms of what they know and what policies to be able to put in place for persons with disabilities. And then in Nigeria, we didn't have a Disability Act. So basically, whatever advocacy we were carrying out were from like an experience-based angle and some of the research that we have carried out as, as um, individuals and as organizations. So we, we had to come up with a lot of ways with which um, maybe existing policies and existing frameworks can begin to have a component that speaks to uh, disability issues within um, maybe ministries, departments, and agencies, and overall within the, within the government. And we've had instances where we go for advocacy, I go for advocacy, and when I'm putting out issues of persons with disabilities, maybe um, some of the access that have been denied them, you, you find questions like, oh, so really, how, how, how is this happening? Like, you could see that our leaders are completely clueless and completely not knowledgeable on this issue. So we decided that whenever we're approaching them, we will go with an evidence-based um, data, an evidence-based finding such that they will not counter our, our um, asking. They would not assumptions, mm -hmm. but we make sure that we carry out evidence-based um, data and facts that we go to them with. Um, one of the th uh, yes. uh, easy examples I'm going to give us is in the area of um, electoral participation for people with um, disabilities, where we realize that there's a huge gap in terms of why persons with disabilities were no longer voting, and what was the reason why persons with disabilities were not coming out to vote and to exercise their franchise as citizens of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And when we realized what those challenges were, we documented them. We, in fact, we did an assessment uh, from the lens of people with disability took before um, every key stakeholders that have to do with election. And, you know, because it was an evidence-based data, they couldn't deny it. And immediately they began to uh, come up with um, 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 ways with which these issues can be addressed. And not just that, but then in the area of the healthcare, in the area of employment and education, just a holistic approach to um, advocacy. Absolutely fantastic and really commendable and incredible work uh, that you've done. I know that being an activist, especially in Africa, is not easy and I cannot imagine how much more challenges you face uh, because you're also uh, living with disabilities. So congratulations on making sure that you persevere um, against all. That's really commendable. Thank you. I'm going to bring in uh, Reverend Achempo. Maybe you could share about some of uh, your experiences as a religious leader, as a community leader, on how you ensure that you include people living with disabilities in uh, your work in the church. Um, I go to church and I know that I rarely ever see people living with disabilities in church. So it shows that there's a, there's a challenge there. 
Yeah, in my part of the world, that is in Ghana, uh, most people with um, disabilities are poor, uh, partly because of lack of education or taking advantage of training to be able to get good employment and so on and so forth. And especially for those that are children, you know, coming up until their teenage years, uh, when you go through town, you go through the city, all the major roads have people lined up begging for money, begging for food. And most of these people are those with disabilities. So at the church level, uh, we try to promote humanity. Let us live compassionately. Let us be one another's keeper. So not only do we uh, advocate for such people, for such things, but also promote uh, people to adopt and support uh, non-governmental organizations that uh, uh, have ministries to such people. Uh, but at the, at the end of the day, uh, our resolve or our point is the, that people living with disabilities still have potentials. I mean, the world is 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 uh, uh, is full of people who didn't begin right, who began slow, uh, who had all kind of uh, problems. But with community support, uh, social participation, these people uh, have been able to uh, turn their 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 plights into great successes. Uh, and so, at the church level, that is what we do. Uh, everybody matters. Every human being is equally loved by God, and so should we also love them. So that is what we have been doing, and we'll still continue to do. And adding to that, like she said, like Grace said, you know, to make our facilities accessible to them, because either to our architecture and the public meeting places don't have uh, uh, access. You know, you see the way the, the, the place is built. They cannot come, especially people in wheelchairs, uh, uh, cripples falling here and there. So these are some of the things that we do as religious leaders uh, to sensitize people uh, to the plight of, uh, of people that have uh, such uh, disabilities. Thank you so much for that, uh, Reverend. I'm sure other religious leaders that are listening are also challenged to go an extra mile in ensuring that we include people living with disability in our congregations and as part of our religious uh, uh, ceremonies and, and processions. I'm gonna go now to Dr. Marianne. As a frontliner in response to COVID-19, I want you to share with us some of the best examples in which um, as a healthcare professionals, as respondents to COVID-19, you went an extra mile to ensure that you include people living with disabilities this may be through accessing vaccines access to information or just generally how um, as frontliners you were making sure that you are really inclusive of people living with disabilities in responding to COVID-19 Dr. Marianne yes so uh, people living with disabilities form a big percentage within our communities and our society and here i'm also counting people that have also mental challenges or, or um, also some depression sometimes now we term that as also people may, that could be living with some disabilities and we need to first acknowledge what challenges they have, particularly, again, I always refer to where I'm coming from and within the health sector. We want to make sure that they have access to facilities, to for access to move freely from one station to another. And that is when you come over and see that we have special ramps, particularly for people who can't, who are not quite mobile. We have, um, in case of the elevators where we have people who have visual impairment where they can also touch and also feel the numbers. So again, just to make sure that they're, they're included in our day-to-day -day activities. Allow me to talk about also the lab where we're doing a lot of work that involves our hands, that involves us walking up and about. We have also special features where we have laboratories that have benches that reach a level where if, in case you have um, a, a wheelchair, you can quickly move in and continue with your work without feeling left out or considering another career option. 
But also, I want to also acknowledge there are some parts in medical care and medical field where people with living, living with disabilities may actually be disadvantaged and, and are not quite encouraged when we're selecting either students to train, i.e. like surgeons where you need all your uh, Connect capabilities so you can stand for many hours, but you need to use your eyes and vision and your hearing uh, capacity. That can prove to be a, a, a bit of a challenge. And I do acknowledge that maybe a bit of discrimination there. And either we need policies, we need other sectors, other players to come up with better um, uh, paperwork or so policies or strategies that we can include everyone, give them a proper and equal opportunity to participate in the care, offering care, and also exercise in their medical uh, practices within our society. So there's still very major gaps, but we're trying to close these gaps in, um, in the healthcare sector and where, where I'm based. Thank you. Absolutely wonderful work. Uh, again, truly inspiring. And I think there is indeed a lot more that we can still do to ensure that we are more inclusive in our work, our programming, ensuring that people with living with disabilities are able to access healthcare services. We're going to talk more about that on the other side of this break. For now, let us hear what people on the street had to say. People with disability are being taken care of, but not in the measure that they deserve. So more efforts should be put in that direction. And I think that those guys are actually neglected. Most times you see them, they are, you know, they actually form like 90% of the, the chunk of beggars that you have around. So if they are actually uh, adequately taken care of, I'm sure they will, they will resort to begging and all that because one, most of them don't have the same opportunities that. I mean, able, uh, full, full uh, body people have. People with disabilities are not well taken up in our country. However, they have tried somehow to say that even them, they get the full rights of their as, a, as, as humans. However, they have not yet fully been taken. Because if you move around the roads, we are here in the town, but if you try to move, many people, the lame, are on the, are on the streets asking for money. And that is our word on the street for this episode. Remember, we are talking about access to healthcare services by people living with disability, those who are often marginalized, that are invisible. We hide them in society. And that puts me into the next uh, point of discussion the stigma and discrimination that is attached to living with disability. And I want Grace to share some of the work that you have done to sort of sensitize the community and raise awareness that disability is not inability. Let us stop hiding uh, people living with disability so that they are part of a community, but most importantly, so that they also have an equal opportunity to realize their potential. So how have you been raising awareness and uh, trying to counter that stigma and discrimination faced by people living with disability? All right, thank you. Uh, I would start by saying that um, we live in a society that has very little or no knowledge on disability issues. And I say that from a place of experience because um, 20, let me, let me say 21 years ago, I had no idea what a life of a person with disability is like. Like, in fact, I had never had a close encounter with anybody with a disability. So I didn't care whether they existed or like I was just completely indifferent until it happened to me when I was involved in a road traffic accident and I became a person with a disability. So it became all new for me because I didn't know my left from my right. I couldn't navigate. I just didn't know what to do. And that just tells me that mm. there are a lot of people in the society who really don't even know that such people, people with disabilities exist. And even if they know that they exist, they do not, they have no idea what the challenges or life of a person with disability is like. So for me, I had to learn how to live life all over again as a person with disability. And I, and because I didn't have full knowledge, I had to do a lot of research online. I had to rely on information from people and all of that. So first, because of this gap, Part of my sensitization then was that I would be deliberate about educating the general public on people with disabilities. And then I, I remember that I was a spokesperson for over 25 persons with disabilities, 25 million persons with disabilities in Nigeria alone. And I was leveraging on platforms, TV, radio, church platforms, and every stakeholder meeting that 
they would give me an opportunity to just speak for like three, five minutes. I would quickly let them know about the challenges. First, the number of people with disabilities that we have in Nigeria alone as of then was like 25 million. And there are various forms of disability from the physical to the hearing impaired to the deaf, like educating them on the various uh, clusters of disability and um, basically uh, educating them from the rights-based approach and not from the charity-based approach because what we see and what we experience on a daily is people um, people relating with us from the charity aspect where persons with disabilities are viewed almost immediately as people who um, who can be given handouts to like immediately you see me you just want to hand me some money or you just want to um, just get me like food but a life of a person with disability is beyond that first you have to identify or rather view the person from a point of right this is a human being faced with inherent rights and because you view me as a human being you would want to know first and foremost what's your name what do you do what's your qualification are you employed do you have any source of income and livelihood like just get to know if I have, if I'm living a, a very normal and an active life and not just to hand me a, a, a small change from your purse or from your pocket, because my life is way beyond that. So it's basically addressing or rather sensitizing people to approach persons with disabilities from the rights-based um, approach, how you would want to give them employment opportunity because they have the right qualification, or you would want to give them a chance to ac ac access to education because of course, they are they are the age of um, of um, gaining meaningful admission into schools and 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 all of that. So the challenges stems from first the perception of people, how they view people with disabilities from the charity approach, and their attitude, overall attitude towards people with disabilities. So mine was a holistic sensitization, where we tell you we tell you the challenges you face are not just environment, where movement is not easy, especially for those on wheelchairs or on the roller skate, but also the attitude of people towards us is also very, very important. And then we're also looking at the institutional approach where there needs to be policies and laws and frameworks that speak to the challenges and the life of people with disabilities. Absolutely agree with you, Grace. Rights-based approach and looking beyond the disability, but concretely giving you the opportunity because you are Grace, you are brilliant, you are capable, you are confident, and you deserve uh, that opportunity. I think I, I totally I, I agree yeah. with that with you on that one. Grace, you have the final word, and I want you to be very frank and very unapologetic in telling us what is it that we're doing wrong? Because we've had the political speeches, the commitments, but clearly we are not doing enough to ensure that we include people living with uh, disabilities and decision-making, giving them economic opportunities, and just overall ensuring that we improve their livelihood. So what are we doing wrong and what needs to happen now? All right. So first, I'm, I'm going to say to Reverend Anthony and Dr. Marianne, beautiful um, comments that you, you both have made there. We have to begin to back what we say with action. But for me as a person with a disability, I would say that it's about time you treat people with disabilities as equal citizens of the society and not those who are of, of a lesser class. Why would you come to someone like Gracie and you would think that all I need is just handouts and just you know change from your purse or from your pocket? What I need is 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 employment opportunities for those who have the, the qualifications. What I need for people in my community is access to education for those children who, whose parents cannot even afford to pay their school fees. What I want to see is access to healthcare for women and girls with disabilities. What I want to see is, is laws who, who, that are already in place are being implemented and not just um, a, a document that is on a shelf, decorating your shelf. Absolutely powerful, and I couldn't have said it better. I totally agree with you. Thank you so much, Grace, and keep up the excellent work that you are doing in Nigeria, and I'm sure you are reaching out to the rest of the continent with your messaging and your impact. And thank you again uh, to Reverend Achempong, as well as uh, Dr. Marianne, for also sharing your experiences. In wrapping up today's show, I want to emphasize that ensuring that people living with disability have access to healthcare, education, 
economic opportunities and social services is not a privilege. It is a right the same way it is a right to all of us. We are all equals. We all deserve the same rights, the same opportunities. And most importantly, they also deserve the same opportunity that we have to realize our full potential. So remember that you as an individual at home have a role to play. What are you doing today to ensure that you reduce the stigma and discrimination attached to living with disability? This is Africa Health Check. Make sure you connect with us on all our social media platforms. We would love to hear from you. Until we meet again, same time, same place, same date. As I always say, the future is Africa, the future is today.